Good evening, good evening, Slava Bala. Um, this is a very uh, uh, unique event as mentioned by uh, my colleague uh, Mira. Um, certainly, this is uh, uh, not the first time that uh, um, Indonesian Embassy um, created this, this, this activities uh, because in the past um, we had in this very room uh, introduction of uh, a book on uh, Batak, of, of people living uh, not uh, Sumatra by uh, Professor uh, Lucas. And even before that, we had also the opportunity to um, introduce uh, a book on Bali, actually uh, produced uh, by the Indonesian Embassy in collaboration with uh, the uh, Museum of Volker Kunde. And this is uh, the third time that uh, we have uh, this kind of opportunity and in the future we will um, again um, have planned to um, also uh, introduce uh, more books about uh, Indonesia, in particular what we have uh, uh, very very uh, near future the project is on Sulawesi syllabus and also on uh, Maluku, on, on Molukas, which is now the book on Maluku, uh, on Ambon is under uh, uh, preparation, is in the final stage, uh, hopefully sometime in May or June we can uh, publish uh, this book. Again, um, with the collaborations between the uh, Indonesian Embassy and uh, the Museum uh, for the um, The distinguished uh, guest participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, uh, certainly a very, very uh, great uh, honor for me to have all of you here in this uh, humble uh, building of the uh, Indonesian uh, Embassy. Uh, for tonight, uh, we have a very uh, a particular presentation um, on um, Irian Jaya, also um, very popular uh, name, everybody called also as the name of Papua. Uh, last night I had an opportunity to um, talk with uh, the general manager of you know, Hotel Sofitel. Hotel Sofitel, uh, um, he is uh, the digital manager of Hotel Sofitel and he is a Dutchman, he is from Netherlands and he um, was very, very excited, you know, to, to tell me about his uh, journey to, to um, uh, this region, Papua. Um, he, um, uh, when I introduced to him that I am the Indonesian ambassador, and he was so excited. Oh, Excellency, I just visited your beautiful country, Papua New Guinea. So different, this is different. I said, no, no, Papua New Guinea is not my country. I said, Papua New Guinea is a different country. That's neighbor of Indonesia. Of course, uh, Papua uh, uh, New Guinea uh, is the half of the, the, the whole uh, uh, Papua, um, 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 big Papua island. Um, this is part, West Papua is part of um, Indonesia. You will be uh, explained by Astrid, of course, uh, where is Papua with um, Indonesian archipelago countries uh, consists of 12,000 islands. Sometimes it's very confusing where Papua is. Uh, um, learning about the Indonesia archipelago is, 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 is very, very uh, complicated. Well, about uh, this uh, gentleman, the, the, the general manager of Hotel Sofitel, and uh, when he was so excited to tell me about his, uh, his uh, travel to, to, to Papua, as he said, and then he clarified, yes, this is Papua. To the, one of the most uh, uh, beautiful part of Papua is uh, Raja Ampat, is called. It's Raja Ampat is a very, very beautiful uh, place. It's good for uh, uh, diving. Um, this is the best uh, coral reef uh, that uh, we, we found in, in the world. Um, but the book of Astrid, of course, not about the coral reef or about uh, 
about um, um, Burung, about the Chandrawasi uh, bird. But suddenly this is uh, uh, very much on her very, very uh, courageous uh, um, journey to deep uh, part of uh, Papua. He met many uh, um, indigenous uh, Papuans, of course, uh, very, very interesting people with a very uh, inter interesting uh, costume. You may learn later on what kind of costume that the people in yeah, the original, the, 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 um, the um, Papuan people are uh, daily uh, uh, wearing. But this certainly is a great honor for me to have uh, uh, Astrid um, in this room tonight to introduce uh, her beautiful books about her um, journey, about her adventure to, to the island of, of Papua. I hope you will um, enjoy this evening with uh, the presentation of um, Astrid and also after that uh, we enjoy a little bit uh, Indonesian food. Uh, hopefully it's not too hot for you. <laughs> so with this um, brief um, introduction, I don't want to take that much uh, time for, for, for Astrid because uh, tonight is the night of uh, Astrid. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Alles Gute, Servus. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to the most awaited part of the evening, please welcome Ms. Astrid Rooney. Thank you very much. Good evening. Selamat malam. Guten Abend. We are today a very inter international community. This is a very international soiree, so I will talk in English, but since the book I'm presenting is naturally written in German, there will also be some readings in German. For those who do not speak any German, I want to invite you during those readings to listen and to observe to those to this which is not said, to the non-verbal aspect of words, meaning body language, meaning voice. And be surprised how much you understand without even understanding. There is one thing I have to do, and it's not too bad that it happens, because this reminds you also to do that. That's my bag. And in the bag, maybe you heard it already twice, it went ring, ring. So, please everybody switch off your mobile phones too. I want to, maybe we can, we can switch off the light. Tonight I want to take you on a journey to West Papua. And West Papua is not only the most distant point from Jakarta, if you count the miles, it is also the most distant region in every other respect I know. Just think of the different ethnic origin, Papuans are Melanesians. Subsequently, their culture, their way of thinking, of living, is completely different from those of the rest of Indonesia. Papua is on the island of New Guinea. And New Guinea is the second biggest island in the world, and it's divided in two parts. You can see that quite mathematically in the middle, quite artificially. This is the well-known Papua New Guinea. And 
not so well known here the Indonesian provinces Papua and here Papua Barat. Since um, Papuans refer to both of these provinces as West Papua, I will also use this term in my speech. West Papua, a country of endless rainforests. And hopefully some music too. So I think it's coming. Miko, thank you so much. I think it's coming. So it says already one. Ah, here we go. Consisting of clear streams and huge lakes. My main means of transport are my feet. Crossing road bridges consisting of nothing but natural fibers. Swinging elastically, almost like a trampoline. And crossing bridges, which demanded greater skills than I had. Wie ich den Papua so hinterherkeuche, entdecke ich, dass sie barfuß wandern. Nicht nur innerhalb des Dorfes, zu Hause, wo man sich sicher fühlt, gehen sie barfuß. Nein, sie machen auch so eine Tagestour ohne Schuhe. Ja, natürlich, die haben ja keine. Der Besitz von Schuhen und dass man folglich wählt, ohne welche zu gehen, ist mir anscheinend so selbstverständlich, dass mir das erst jetzt auffällt. Ich kann über mich selbst nur den Kopf schütteln. Ich stecke in Trekkingstiefeln. Bloße Papua-Füße geben allerdings besseren Halt. Sowohl auf den meist glitschigen Pfaden als auch beim Überqueren der klassischen Einstamm-Papua-Brücke. Wenn die Tiefe der Schlucht oder die Dynamik des Flusses mein Selbstvertrauen so weit untergraben, dass mein Gleichgewichtsgefühl ins Wanken gerät, dann lasse ich mich mitten auf der Brücke in den bewährten Reitersitz gleiten und hilfe mich hinter Breite und hinter Breite ans andere Ufer. Die Papua haben ihren Spaß an meinem Anblick. Den ganzen Tag überrasten wir nur ein einziges Mal. Ich hatte schon gefürchtet, gar nicht. Während ich mich bereits glücklich schätze, heute mit nur neun bequemen Kilogramm zu wandern, entdecke ich, dass nur zwei der vier Männer, die ich auf ihrem Weg begleite, überhaupt Gepäck bei sich haben. Ihre Bündel sind bescheiden und handlich. Eines wiegt vielleicht gerade einmal zwei Kilogramm. Wie kommt es, dass ich kleine Person neun Kilogramm an Dinge benötige und sie maximal zwei? Für den gleichen Zeitraum, für die gleiche Tour. Was schleppe ich eigentlich alles mit mir rum? Wieder zurück zu Hause hat mich meine beste Freundin gefragt, und wie war's? So eine lange Reise und so fern der Zivilisation. Und das Erste, was mir zurück in der Zivilisation aufgefallen ist, ist, dass ich eine Unmenge an Dingen besitze. Und dass die Verwaltung dieser Unmenge an Dingen eine Unmenge an Zeit verschlingt. Zum Beispiel Kleidungsstücke. Bin ich doch gerade vier Monate mit nur vier Kleidungsstücken ausgekommen. Tja, so kann Zivilisation das Leben auch schon ganz schön kompliziert machen. West Papua is one of the last places on earth where you can explore pristine primary forest. And if you take your time, nature reveals its entire beauty to you. The flower of a wild passion fruit. Wow. 
West Papua is one of the last spots on earth where you can encounter people who are still living like they've been living thousands of years ago. All they need is provided by nature. Eine Weile wandern wir drei banausspinkerfasernackten Vogeljägern hinterher. Meine Augen folgen unwillkürlich ihren geschmeidigen Bewegungen und bleiben an ihren muskulösen Pobacken hängen. Ich kann nicht umhin, der Anblick bewegt mich hormonell. An so viel männliche Nacktheit in der Öffentlichkeit bin ich einfach nicht gewöhnt. Als die Jäger ihre archaischen Vogellockrufe ausstoßen, bremsen sich meine Hormone aber augenblicklich wieder ein. Die Männer verwandeln sich im Bruchteil einer Sekunde in kleine Jungs, die im Wald spielen. We are in Pogisiga, a tiny little mountain village at a sea level of about 1,800 meters. And the village is only like 25 miles, 40 kilometers from the highest point of this island, which is called Putrak Jaya. And this highest point of the island is covered with snow. In the 1960s, we had a big banner headline in our newspapers, Snow at the Equator, here in Austria. We had this better headline, and why? Because it was Heinrich Haller, an Austrian explorer, an Austrian alpinist, who was the first to climb the summit. Or at least the first a newspaper ever took notice of. This is the village of Proxica. Breakfast smoke is mingling with the mist of the passing. And I'm having a sweet potato for breakfast, well, like for almost every meal in West Papua. The tubers are either roasted directly on the fire or they are put underneath in the ash and cooked there. Also, the leaves can be eaten as a spinach or they serve as herbal medicine. For example, against birds, as this guy explains to me holding his cigarette. He is a Moni, he's from the ethnic group of the Moni, and he introduces himself to me. Zaya Kebala Suku, Nama Zaya Patlokas. I am the clan's chief, my name is Patlokas. So he told me that he just came home from work and I saw him jumping over this fence, which is about waist high. And, well, because, I mean, he looked fit, but I got curious how old he is. Most Papuans don't know their age. But he made me so curious that I asked him, that that's what he answers. He said, Ibu, if you had five wives and 23 children, and you worked every day like I do, you wouldn't have time to count your years either. <laughs> And then he introduced his second wife to me. She's called Alpia and she rubs her neck with the leaf of a gosok shrub. And she enjoys it. Oh, oh, oh. And Patukas tells me, it helps against rheumatism and against muscular pain and tension in the neck. So I said, that's the thing I have to have. I took one and I did it like she did it and the effect was um, severe. It felt as if, um, as if I had, uh, the, yeah, as if I had rubbed my neck with chili. So I got a hot flush, and then Alpia tried to set me at ease. It's very healthy, she said. At this moment, I discovered that her left ring finger is cut. But Lucas tells me, that they lost two children from malaria. Cutting parts of your fingers is a way 
to show your mourning over a death. He changes the subject, takes out a small wooden bag and opens it. And inside of the bag there's another small wooden bag and he opens it. And I think immediately of this Russian doll, this babushka I used to play with when I was a child. And inside of all the bags, he shows me two cowrie shells. The cowrie shells he will use for his two eldest sons, which are not married yet. The cowrie shells serve as a bright price for them. His eldest son, Nade, is his pride and joy. He's a carpenter by trade. Lucas invites me to see his construction site he's been working on for two weeks now. It's going to be a woman's house. I can recognize that immediately because it has two entrances. One for women and one for pigs. The pigs are very important to the Papuans. They do not only serve as money, they are also status symbols. And the women possess the knowledge how to bring them up well. Yoni, the daughter of my host family, stays always with me. Now we are regarding the interior of the Moni women's house and on the right hand side we see a fence. And this fence separates the pig's thigh from the place where the women live. This house has a diameter of about 5 meters and it's inhabited on average by 10 women. And if you concern the, the space the women take for themselves and the space the women dedicate to their pigs, you may get an idea of how important those animals are to the Papuans. This square hole in the middle will serve as a fireplace later on. The four poles are here, are just serving for a, for a construction of the, of the roof here, of the roof framework, and the middle pole will be removed as soon as the house is finished. It serves only for constructing the roof correctly. The Kinder fürchten sich vor mir, und sie verstecken sich hinter ihren Müttern. Ich blase eine Luftballon auf. Die Neugierde auf das Unbekannte siegt schließlich über die Angst vor dem Unbekannten. Nach einer halben Stunde bereits weichen die Älteren von ihnen nicht mehr von meiner Seite. Wenn ich etwas erzähle, was sie besonders bewegt, verleihen die Papua ihren Gefühlen so ungehemmt laut malerischen Ausdruck, wie das bei uns nur Kleinkinder tun. Sie quietschen und, und glucksen. Sie johlen und brusten, sie kichern und gurgeln und fiepen und knurren. Als ich mit laut male, haben wir eine erdteilverbindende Verständigungsebene entdeckt, die keine Sprachbarriere erkennt. Wie unmittelbar ist sich in der menschlichsten aller Sprachen auszutauschen. Wie unmissverständlich, wie wesentlich und für Überraschung differenziert. Ich bin fasziniert. Aber irgendwann knurrt mir trotzdem der Magen. Die Papa haben ein feines Sensorium. Gerade als ich beginne, innerlich unruhig zu laufen, reicht mir eine Ibu, eine Frau, eine riesige Ubi, eine Süßkartoffel. Diese beiden Worte gehören je nach Blickwinkel zu den Stolpersteinen oder Wortspieloptionen wie das Indonesische zu bieten hat. Amüsement auf der Zuhörerseite ist den beiden Fällen garantiert. Schließlich essen alle. Dann beginnen die Ersten, sich schlafen zu legen. In Papua passiert das völlig nebenbei. Das Schlafengehen ist hier ausgesprochen ritualos. Man schluckt den letzten Bissen seiner Süßkartoffel, schaut noch eine halbe Stunde ins Feuer und irgendwann einmal befreit man sich herzerfrischend hemmungslos vom schädlichen Verdauungsgastdruck im Magen und gibt einfach kommentarlos nach hinten um. Keinerlei sanitäre Pflichtgänge, kein Kleidungswechsel, kein Ich gehe jetzt schlafen, kein äh, Gute Nacht. 
Die anderen in der Hütte unterhalten sich einfach weiter. Getreu dem Prinzip, wenn er schläft, dann hört er es nicht und wenn er es hört, dann schläft er nicht. The roofing material you see here is either grass or leaves. And what they best prefer is are the leaves of the sago palm. These are folded in the middle and then sewed together with lianes. And when they are dry, when they are fully dry, they are attached to the rafters. The sago doesn't only... Oh! Wrong, another one. <laughs> as soon as the outer walls of such a house are erected, the rest of the house is fixed without any tools, without nails, without screws, but with the employment of feet, fingers and teeth. The substructure of the floor consists of poles thick like an arm. And over this post is a layer of splinter-resistant bamboo to make it softer. Those natural fibers, they serve as very good tear-resistant strings to tie the whole of the house together. What we see is on the right-hand side the floor technician and on the left-hand side his son. So in West Papua, a profession is still handed on from one generation to the other, like in former times here too. <coughs> the nights are cold in West Papua's highlands, so what they always keep alive is the fire, day and night, it's always kept alive. There are no windows in those houses, so the only source of light is the fire. And in the daytime, also the very low, by the way, entrance. But I promise you, if you don't have eyes like a cat and you can see at night, then you bang your head twice a day on one of those poles. Stay in the height like this. The house can be finished in a three weeks' time, and if this was a good carpenter, it can last up for ten years. And we have to concern that weather conditions are completely different there. It rains like mad every day. So this, is, this was to me quite a surprising fact to learn. The Sago Palm doesn't only provide the best roofing material for the Papua, but it's also a Papuan staple food. It reminded me somehow of gelatin. It's completely tasteless, to be honest. At least to me, but it contains a lot of carbohydrates. And with the small animals that live inside of the palm, the grubs, it's said to taste a lot better. I haven't been offered that, so I can't really verify this. I'm not really unhappy about it. To gain this sago, to extract that from the palm, the palm is cut and its bark is used as a half pipe. And this is the inner piece of the palm and this is chopped and filled into this half pipe and then they put water onto it and wrong thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they start to knead it. And there is a, a piece of textile filtering it, filtering this pith, and what comes out is the starch. And this starch they collect, and then they wait for the sago to set down. And as soon as the sago is set down, the water is drained off, and here it is, sago. They cook, some, they make some sort of dough out of it, so they have little, little bread things that they make. And you can also find it here, sometimes in the, in the Asian restaurants, they have this coconut soup and very small um, transparent balls in it. This is sago, 
But they put a lot of sugar in it because without it we would have a bit taste. It is for us. They love it. Yeah, that's another staple food of the Papuan. It's red fruit uamera. To me it tasted somehow similar to sago. There's not really a culinary reason for which you go to West Papua and I hope very much that our Indonesian buffet tonight will not contain too much Papuan food. <laughs> but this uh, uh, red fruit guamera is used as a very effective herbal medicine. Yeah, just imagine, in Papua everything is prepared without salt, without fat, without any spices or herbs, just pure as it is. So if you travel to West Papua, please don't forget the salt shaker. And still, salt is one of the most, um, of the favorite uh, presents you can bring to a village. And if you come from West Papua back to Austria, one of the most favorite presents you can bring will be this one. <laughs> the Kutika. That's what they'll ask you for. Don't do it like I did it, I didn't take one. They just tease you afterwards. Yeah, since thousands of years, men's ready to wear uh, clothes number one, famous as like, like no other traditional costume on this planet, as the ambassador already mentioned before. It consists of nothing but a dried out gourd, a bottle shaped pumpkin. Church and government have been campaigning together for decades now against the traditional costumes of the Papua. They don't like them to run around half naked. And missionaries are importing Western clothes. They are trying hard to establish a consciousness of shame in the people's mind. With women they are quite successful. Their traditional costume being uh, topless with a grass skirt has almost disappeared in four and a half months. I just met one woman dressed traditionally. Only one. And a lot of men. So with men it's different. It doesn't work to that extent. Men are maybe more conscious of their traditions. Or maybe they are just not as faithful followers of fashion. In Papua, just like elsewhere. But I personally, I, I, I respect them a lot for that. Yeah, picking up the topic food again. If uh, Papuans want to cook for, a, for the whole village, then they use their earth oven. This is a pit of about a meter of depth and about one and a half meter uh, of width. Is it width? I don't know. Something like this. And then the women uh, line this pit with banana leaves and then they bring all the crops from their fields. They carry the whole day from the fields, everything home. And I have the pleasure that they made such an earth oven ceremony for me as a welcome. Yeah, and then they put everything in it, like the taro bulbs here and the red fruit and the leaves you can see. These are leaves from the ubi. And the leaves are better than the, than the potato, than the tuber. I really like them. Yeah, so they're putting the cabbage and maize and, and soya pods, all of their crops, they're putting one over the other. And then you can see steam rising. And the steam comes from hot stones. And these hot stones, they are brought by the men with split branches. And then they are wrapped into banana leaves and put into the vegetable heap. And then the heap is covered with a layer of leaves again. And some stones are put on top. And until the meal is done, there is always someone making 
music. Wrong one. No. They love to play guitar or jaw harp. They love to sing. And being their guest, you're always welcome to join them. Or you just listen and meditate, watching the mimosa, closing at the gentle touch of your hand and opening slowly again. Or you watch one of those orange and violet spiders. Their shape is almost square. Or you watch a drop of water with your eyes rolling down the waxy tarot leaf without even wetting it. Or you watch the volleyball match. Pakiola is also watching. His green whistle always stays in his mouth. At first sight, he looks as if he try to protect his body with his hands from being shot. At second sight, I discover that his left hand is in a gray stocking. When Pagula built his house five years ago, a tree trunk had fallen on his hand and shattered it. He was a brilliant volleyball player before. He's a fair judge now. If you want to explore West Papua's back country, the only possibility to do so is by plane. There is still no trans on highway. The only streets existing are in the coastal and urban areas. But getting such a plane to take you somewhere is not too easy. The only place you can buy a ticket, a regular ticket to, is Wamena in the Balion Valley. Here it is. And to all the other places, you can see you can't simply buy a ticket. You have to convince a missionary personally to take you with him. And that can be quite difficult, especially if you're not working for any religious organization. My next destination was Cuerba in the valley of the Mambarano River. A place uh, where tourists or foreigners are not allowed for whatever reason. But as Albert Einstein said, there are no absolutes, everything's relative. We are on board a Helio Courier, that's the name of the plane. The engine of the plane sounds like an agricultural, like a tractor. But the cockpit looks to me like a Rolls Royce. <laughs> This is my pilot, Tom. He personally climbs the plane to check all the technical details and he calls it his foreplay. <laughs> no, I want to read that part. Echte Fluggefühle. Mein Rucksack und ich werden verwogen und mein Ticket wird zum Kilopreis berechnet. Am Flugfeld schaukelt mir der brandbräuchige Missionspilot Tom entgegen. Er übernimmt mein Gepäck. Zum ersten Mal seit meiner Ankunft in West Papua vor vier Wochen spreche ich Englisch. Toms Helio Courier hat vier Sitzplätze, inklusive seines eigenen. Die winzige Öffnung der Gepäcksluke ist nicht für das Format eines durchschnittlichen Damentrennbarrucksacks geschaffen. Ich fühle mich wie im türkischen Dampfbad. Die Luft ist dicht wie ein vollgesogener Schwamm. Tom tropft und stropft. Mein Rucksack steckt. Erst als ich die Wasserflasche raus und die Isoliermatte runternehme, passt er in den Flachbauch des Missionsfliegers. Dann hilft Tom seinen Kugelbauch auf die Motorhaube der Propellermaschine und kontrolliert die Funktionstüchtigkeit der beweglichen Teile an den Tragflächen. Aus zwei rostigen Fässern wird die Maschine betankt. Um mich bloß nicht zu enttarnen, falte ich Hände und bewege Lippen, als Tom für gutes Flugwetter bittet. Dann fliegen wir los. Ich sitze neben ihm im Cockpit. Und obwohl er mich beinahe anschreit, verstehe ich kaum ein Wort. 
Der Propellerlärm sabotiert bei offenen Fenstern jede Kommunikation. Die Welt vibriert. Steigbügel, Amboss und Hammer tanzen sich Taki. Als wir unsere Flughöhe erreicht haben, beginne ich zu frieren. Da aber Tom vom Vorspiel, wie er verschmitzt seine Kontrollarbeiten vor Abflug nennt, noch schwitzt, nicke ich nur höflich und schreie Antworten zurück, die für jede Gelegenheit passen würden. Das Cockpit der Propellermaschine hat mit seinem holzfornierten Armaturenbrett die Optik eines Rolls-Royce Phantom aus den 30er Jahren. Alle Knöpfe, Schalter und Hebel sehen so aus, als ob sie völlig mechanisch funktionieren würden. Mein Matador Lego Merklin Auge bringt ins Innere eines Zugschalters vor. Dorthin fantasiere ich mir eine direkte Seilzugverbindung via Umlenkrolle zum Höhenmotor. An einem anderen Zugschalter hängt das Seil, das den Motor anreißt. Rein physisch gesehen habe ich am Beifliegersitz zweifelsfrei die Rolle der co inne. Alle Schalter haben eine so verständige Beschriftung, dass ich mir zutraue, auf Anweisung den richtigen richtig zu bedienen. Nur schade, dass Tom nicht im Entferntesten daran denkt, von den in mir schlummernden Talenten Gebrauch zu machen. Unter uns taucht mitten im Panorama füllenden Grün ein spektakulärer Wasserfall mit zwei Kaskaden auf. Tom fliegt mich gentlemanlike in einer Schleife rund um das Dschungelschlamm gespritzende Getöse besieht sich umgehend die digitalen Fotos, die ich davon geknipst habe, um dann eine weitere, tiefere Schleife zu fliegen, damit ich besser knipsen kann. Gerade als ich ihn bitten will, endlich sein Fenster zu schließen, klemmt er sich den Steuerknüppel zwischen die Knie, um die Hände zum Schäden seiner Mandarine frei zu haben. Die Schale zockt dann durch die Fensteröffnung. Ich, die ich von meinen Beifahrern oft für Nebenbeschäftigungen beim Autofahren kritisiert werde, fühle mich in diesem Moment darum sehr verbunden. Und das Argument, dass im Luftraum weniger Verkehr herrscht als auf der Straße, hebt sich durch die Erschwernis des Navigierens in drei Dimensionen meiner Ansicht nach allen mal auf. Als ich den Steuerknüppel selbst führen darf, kriegt mein intensives Fluggefühl auch noch den Schussabenteuercharakter, dem für mich Erotik in den Mund. Hormon überschwemmt, frage ich darum, ob wir nicht ein Looping machen könnten. Die Sekunden bis zu seiner Antwort bange ich vor den Auswirkungen meines Übermuts. Ich bin ehrlich erleichtert, als er mir erklärt, dass Helio Kuriers nicht für Lupix gebaut sind. <lacht> ja, die Opening auf der Hedge ist maybe 80 cm wide and 25 or something like that high. But you can also remove the back seats and put the luggage in there. You fly the maximum altitude of 70 feet, 2000 meters. But since the mountains are ranging up, up to 4800 meters, I felt every time a little uncomfortable when it started to get foggy. Below us, nothing but forest. And meandering rivers. That's a two story waterfall I was describing before. And here, the proof, the proof. <laughs> Flying a plane is not more challenging than riding a car. Half an hour later, we're landing in Cuyapa, a village of a Hundred souls. The children are proudly presenting their mini Helio Couriers. Even the simplest model, uh, models have a have a proper propeller. If the boy is running, then this small thing in front, which he turned a little bit like this, starts to turn in the wind. So they are running up and down the airstrip, getting all crazy about a white lady visiting their village. Yeah. And in the dawn, they show me what such an airstrip can be best used for. A 
another one of their favorite games is imitating their father's hunting. A father of five boys shows me his assortment of arrows. The bamboo arrow, he says, is used for catching birds. Because of its three ends, you can shoot a flying animal a lot easier. Can you understand that? And yes, yes, I can. The two arrows with the barbs are for hunting pigs. If you don't kill the pig with one shot, the arrow stays in his body. And if you run afterwards, after it you can get it easily. And the arrows with the ornaments are for men. For, for men? Yes, yes, for men. The last war was three years ago. And uh, what was it about your war? Uh, <laughs> about a woman, <laughs> he replies. Do you also have wars for women in Austria? He asks. Well, um, <sighs> yes, uh, but we don't fight them with bow and arrow. If men are not hunting, they are building boats and carving pails with their machetes. Or they are producing decorative artifacts like this bracelet. This is a cassowary, a bird which cannot fly. It grows up to one meter and eighty. Papuans are raising it for its meat. And they love the claws. Put together as a necklace. Apropos vanity. The girls love to wear a layer of chalk on their face because their ideal is a bright skin. And women are dressing each other's hair every day, really artistically. This granny is enduring the creativity of her four grandchildren for half an afternoon. In the morning, women usually go to the vegetable gardens. They plant peanuts and they plant manioc. They plant taro and they plant sweet potato. The afternoon they spend in their kitchen. And it's also the women producing the kitchen equipment. These are two food containers. They're made of banana leaves and they are sewed together with lianis. In West Papua's Highlands, women also produce everywhere they stand and go this, these crotchet bags. They're called Noken. I also brought one for you. You can have a look at it afterwards. It's here. This one was given to me by a, by a mom I was living in and she told me that she colored it with um, herbal colors and now they have, um, they, have, they have the wool which is already colored on the market and she was very proud of, of, that, of that one because I told her it's a lot more beautiful and she gave it to me at the end and I'm very touched. <laughs> Yeah, here you can see this crotchet tin. We are in front of the village school. This is the teacher. And today he's doing a program for adults. He will hold an AIDS prevention lecture. In West Papua there are 18 times more AIDS infected people than in the rest of Indonesia. How comes? It's such a secluded place. Well, the Papuans have the bad luck to be rich of natural resources like copper, gold, uh, gas, tropical wood. And the companies who came to search for these um, natural resources, they do not only attract foreign workers, but they also attract prostitutes. There is an urgent lack 
even of information about AIDS. Therefore, missionaries have started to train Papuans as a AIDS prevention teachers, and they equip them with a sort of mini flip chart, like this a booklet, they send them from village to village. And he's such a teacher. And I asked him if I were allowed to accompany him, and he said yes. So this is the first page of the mini flip chart, and it says Apaka Sex Yang Anan Ito. Is sex safe? And what we see is the danger of an AIDS infection visualized in the mosquito, very well chosen in my opinion, because mosquitoes carry malaria and malaria causes so many deaths every year in West Papua's. The biggest problem of health apart from AIDS, as far as I know. Yeah, and we have here a rain shower of HIV viruses and a couple protected by an umbrella a uh, Manika couple, a married couple. Tidak perbunga barang sebelum Manika. Do not enter into bodily union before you're married. And do not enter into bodily union with someone you are not married to. How to Protect your family from AIDS. Follow God's plan. Wait with any sexual intercourse until you're married and stay fidel with your partner. After the AIDS lecture, I once again paid through this mini flip chart. Indeed, there is no condom mentioned. On the backside of the mini flip chart, I discover made in USA. The AIDS prevention teacher says to me, we don't want the people to know about condoms, otherwise they will live in sin. Whoever follows God's plan doesn't need a condom. There's quite a lot to digest for me on this journey, and a good place to do so is the island of Pia. Easily accessible by an international airport. And a marvelous spot to relax. You can even move around comfortably with those minibuses, or are they com comparatively comfortable, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll see you a bit again. Endlich habe ich den richtigen Minibus gefunden. Sofort nimmt mir der Fahrer meinen Rucksack ab und buxiert ihn auf das Busdach. Ich klettere ihm hinterher, um den Rucksack fahrtklar zu machen. Mit einem Regenbus ist hier jederzeit zu rechnen. Ich verpacke den Rucksack in einen Müllsack, den ich eigens zu diesem Zweck mitgenommen habe. Diese Methode bewährt sich auch beim Fliegen in West Papua. Steht das eingecheckte Gepäck unglücklicherweise gerade während eines Regenbusses im Freien, dann würde der, der es hereinholt, zwangsläufig nass werden. Da ist es doch besser erwartet, bis der Regenkurs vorbei ist. Ich hatte zwei Rucksackladungen nasser Kleidung samt aufgeweichter Landkarten nötig, bis ich meine Lektion gelernt hatte. Ich verschnüre also den Müllsack sorgfältig und helfe dem Fahrer dann beim Verteuen des restlichen Gepäcks auf dem Bus nach. So kommen wir ins Gespräch. Mit wie vielen Autos sind, an wie vielen Kilometern sind bei euch eigentlich die Autos reif für den Schrottplatz? Will ich wissen. Hm, so mit 600.000, antwortet er. Sein Bus ist von rostigen Wunden übersät. Kritischere Verletzungen hat er mit Polyesterflicken und Spachtelmasse verarztet. Amoi, Amoi! Zwischen uns liegt ein Haufen verführerisch duftender Maracujas. Er lädt mich mit einer Geste dazu ein, mich zu bedienen. Amoi, Amoi! Wir naschen meine Lieblingsfrüchte und posaunen abwechselnd das Fahrensziel des Busses über den geschäftig brodelnden Marktplatz. Die Papua haben ihren Spaß an einer weißen Fahrgastwerberin. Als ich die dritte Maracuja schlürfe, füllen sich langsam die Sitzplätze in unserem Bus. Aber erst wenn sich die doppelte Anzahl der Personen, für die er zugelassen ist, in sein Inneres geschlichtet hat, werden wir abfahren. 
Ich spüre eine angenehme Ruhe in mir Keime. Amoi, Amoi. Ich sitze auf dem richtigen Bus und es ist mir völlig egal, wie lange ich da noch sitze. Irgendwann wird er mich nach Amoi, Amoi bringen. So viel steht fest. Ich reise zum ersten Mal in meinem Leben völlig zeitlos. Ich sitze am linken Fenster. Am rechten Fenster sitzt eine Frau mit Huhn. In Westpapua herrscht Linksverkehr. Jedes Mal, wenn wir ranfahren, um Menschen zu oder aussteigen zu lassen, wandert das Huhn zu mir und ich reiche es aus dem scheidenlosen Fenster. Dort empfängt es ein potenzieller Käufer. Die Huhn-Eigentümerin nennt ihren Preis. Der potenzielle Huhnkäufer drückt mir ein Bündel Scheine in die Hand und ich reiche die Scheine an die Huhn-Eigentümerin weiter. Sie zählt. Zu wenig. Das Geld war der Retour. Sie fordert ihr Huhn zurück. Der potenzielle Huhnkäufer legt statt des Huhns das Bündel um ein paar Scheine vermehrt nochmals in meine Hände. Noch immer zu wenig. Der Busfahrer will weiter. Das Huhn fährt wieder mit. Nach der dritten erfolglosen Huhnauktion behalte ich das Tier da einfach ein halber bei mir. Das Huhn sitzt auf meinem Schoß. Sein holdiges Gefieder glänzt wie Seide im Sonnenlicht. Der Bus ruckelt und rumpelt und ich kaule das Tier zur Beruhigung. Offenbar genießt es meine Zuwendung. Es drückt sich dicht an mich. Dann hebt es seinen rechten Flügel an, um mir zu zeigen, wo es noch gekraut werden will. Wenn der Fahrer den Motor abstellen würde, könnte man bestimmt hören, dass es vor Genuss gurt. Plötzlich schießt mir die Sache mit der Vogelgrippe durch den Kopf. Wovon kriegt man die nochmal schnell? <lacht> mit spitzen Fingern retourniere ich das Tier, lege meine Hände in den Schoß und versuche mich den Rest der Fahrt über nirgendwo zu kratzen. <lacht> Björn offers an opulent nature to the traveler. Die Felswand, über die der nahe Wasserfall braust, ist etwa 10 Meter hoch und ebenso breit. Links und rechts umwuchert sie opulenter Regenwald. Es ist feucht und heiß und bedeckt. Wie fast jeden Tag in Westpapua. Die schmächtigen Jungs aus Amoy, Uniform mit Bermuda-Shorts und bunten Händen, freuen sich endlich einmal wieder Publikum zu haben. Sie führen mir ihre Lieblingsmutprobe vor. Mit ansteckendem Eifer klettern sie mitten durch den Wasserfall. Lisa, da ist er. Klettern sie mitten durch den Wasserfall die beinahe senkrechte Wand hoch. Dann springen sie, je nach Alter und Mut, Kopf über oder Kopf unter in das Badebecken, das sich unter dem Fall gebildet hat. Also ich war nicht ganz so taff, das Raufklettern hat mich sehr gereizt, aber zum Runterspringen hat mein Mut nicht gereicht. Endlich bin ich oben. Um. Auf allen vier. Der Fall stürzt direkt vor mir in die Tiefe. Ich setze immer noch auf allen vielen um ein paar Respektmeter zurück, ehe ich mich aufrichte. Die Jungs aus Amor pfeifen anerkennend und rufen mir Worte zu, die der Wasserfall verschluckt. Meine Gipfelstürmerpantomime bringt sie zum Lachen. Ich genieße Patschnass den Rundblick. Bevor der Fluss über den Abhang springt, ist er trügerisch, trügerisch ruhig und glatt. Es zieht mich flussaufwärts, hinter die nächste Biegung. Ein paar Vogel kreist über mir. Ich lasse mich auf einem Stein nieder und beobachte ihn. Dann denke ich, der kreist gar nicht. Der gleitet. Spiralförmig. Drei, vier, fünf Kreise. Dann überlässt er sich der Thermik. Sieben, acht, neun, zehn Kreise. Da macht er zwei Flügelschläge. Und dann lässt er sich wieder gleiten. Ja, denke ich. So will ich leben. Zwei Flügelschläge und dann 
wie den Kleinen. Und dann zwei Flügelschläge. Und dann wieder Kleinen. Und dann wieder von vorne. Noch einige Minuten lang versuche ich, meine neue Erkenntnis in meine europäische Lebenswirklichkeit anzupassen. Dann suche ich mir einen Waldweg, der mich wieder nach unten führt. Bei jedem Schritt füllen sich meine zehn Zwischenräume mit der warmen, glitschigen Erde. Meine Füße hinterlassen Abdrücke wie in feuchtem Ton. Ich denke an alle wohlgemeinten Warnungen besorgter Freunde vor meiner Abreise in der gefährlichen Urwald des Papos. Ich finde, ihn barfuß zu erspüren, ist ein schöner Ausklang meiner Reise. Birk Island offers some idyllic and remote beaches. And east from Birk, around the Paraido Islands, you can discover an underwater world of exceptional beauty. West Papua is a destination which captivates its visitor immediately by its cheerful inhabitants, their hospitality, and a sense of humor. <laughs> West Papua is also a destination which asks you all of riddles, but that's another story. Every time I tell about West Papua, time is flying so fast. There's so much to tell that I ended up writing a book. <coughs> there will be time for you to take a look at it and take a look into it afterwards. But first, I want to thank you for your attention. They think you're easy to have, so I covered with this. <laughs> so one long, one short trouser, and one long sleeved, um, what is it, hand, uh, chemise, what is it in English? I forgot. Shirt, yeah, such a long thing, and then a short one, but all covered here, not, not like this. I would never wear that. <laughs> How long did you stay there? I was staying there for four and a half months. So I spent the 
ugly winter there. <laughs> I miss the winter of 2008. Super, I want to do that again. <laughs> I am very curious about the time. Yeah. You, I think you didn't mention the, the name. Can you explain what it means, the Vogelschwein? Oh, you like to ask this question. But your wife is laughing. <laughs> so um, the title is called Bis ins Land des Vogelschweins. And it sounds as strange in English as it does in German to the land of the bird pig. And you know, Günther, there are some secrets which are never revealed until you read the book. But since, <laughs> since I know that you got it at home, I, I know that you have a really fun... <laughs> I explained it already. Ah, <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> I told you there are some secrets which are only revealed if you make the effort to read. Because it's a book, you know. <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so let your fantasy play around and enjoy that. <laughs> So it took me, there, there was this moment, uh, I was so, so astonished and happy and um, moved that if I asked somebody, hey, you want to climb that mountain with me? He said, okay, let's do it now. And I thought, tomorrow maybe. <laughs> so I said, okay, great, yeah, we do it now. And this is something I don't know from my culture. And this is something, everyone was almost waiting for me to, it seemed to me, like as if they were waiting for 10 years until I come and ask them to climb the mountain, because they were, uh, they were so spontaneous, that's what I want to say about that. And I told the guy I asked to climb the mountain, I told him that when, when at home I want to climb a mountain with somebody, I take out my calendar and we're looking for a date in the next two or three weeks, something like that. And he was like, Noah, you're kidding. <laughs> and I was like, oh, serious. And I couldn't imagine that it is like that in the moment I said it, knowing that it is like that. And it took three or four months, and that's really long, until I got into that rhythm here again, because when I left West Harbour, everything was like this, this, it was so quick. I didn't even realize how speed of life was uh, uh, lowered living there. But coming back, I really felt like this, 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 like I don't know, somebody who comes from the countryside and is for the first time has to cross uh, a motorway of eight lanes. That's, that's what I felt like. For the first time after the journey, having traveled a lot, but this was really such a journey back in time, it's so different. And yeah, it was for the first time really a difficult transition. What was the reason that you chose this part of the world? What was the re reason I, I chose this part of the world? Yeah, um, I, I brought two things uh, which Given, I give an answer to the question. If you look around in the embassy, you see a lot of refined, very beautiful carvings. For example, there is this table here, and the chairs, and if you go outside, there are so many wonderful details, like also the shadow puppets, and the chairs outside the table, such refined carvings. And I was in Bali in 1999, and I went into a carver's shop, and there, there were many carvings, and I was I was asking where is this from, where is this from, and the guy was explaining where it is from. And then there was one thing like this, like Arbrut, like Africa. And I said, and this, where is this from? And he said, Iriam Jaya. And then I thought, I said, where is it? And he said, yeah, it belongs to Indonesia, and it's really far, far, far in the, in the, uh, in the east. I'm very bad with directions, you know, I'm like a snake. 
<laughs> so I, th I said, aha, aha. And I got so curious and so interested about this country that I started to read. And I read Heinrich Hara, and I got fascinated. And I thought, oh, I want to go there. I really want to go there. And I bought this book about indigenous people. It has many indigenous people from all over the world, from the Inuit uh, to, to people in the Amazonas region, and also Papua people. And then I knew, I, I, wanna, I once want to live with those people. And for 10 years I was really dreaming of doing that. But also I've been told, girl, don't be stupid, you're going to be eaten up. And I was like, really, eaten up? They're like, yeah, 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 eaten up. Huh? So, they somehow succeeded in making me afraid, and I had to, in German, I say, ich musste mir zehn Jahre Mut anleben. Maybe Salem can translate that. Do you understand what I mean with it? Mut anleben. I had to get courage by getting elder. Is it about? Hey, but don't get my point though. Don't worry. Because she's very good speaking English, uh, German, and she's English native, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so mood and living, meaning um, trying to, to somehow get this courage to simply say, okay, I want to do it, I do it. I can always turn around. And everywhere where people live, I can live. Because all what is needed to live must be there if there are people. Uh, were you healthy all the time? Not all the yeah. time, some digestion yeah. problems. Or... Take medicine from here. With I, I, you know, I, I'm not the insurance uh, kind of type, but I took all the vaccinations they gave me. <laughs> I really bought them all. And of course I had some, some stuff with me, but not too much, because I had to carry everything on my back, and I have 47 kilos, so I can carry 15, and well, I can't carry more. So you have to reduce. But what was the problem is that the... Um, the Papuans are given um, those metal um, tons or metal uh, baskets to collect water by missionaries. And the baskets, no, no, it baskets not a good word, but uh, the metal containers, thank you, are uh, somehow the, 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 the iron, I don't know, the iron whatsoever is getting out of it. It's dissolving in the water. And I could smell that. I took my water from the spring, but the rice I ate with them and the, uh, the potatoes and whatsoever they cooked, so I got this uh, water, metal water, and I could already smell it in the rice. And I got such a digestive problem. Huh? <laughs> the, the, the place I really felt most comfortable in, and the place, this is the place where you saw the huts. Uh, where I had all those houses in different states, which are stages, which I take photo, took photos of. Uh, this was really a place I felt so wonderful in, and I did so many tours around, but I couldn't stand the iron in the, in the, in the food. You know? So that's why I finally had to leave there, because my digestion broke down. <laughs> yeah, so most of the time I was really healthy and okay, but the digestive thing was a problem always when I was in the village. And then I went back to the capital to recover a little bit my poor stomach. And then I went in again and out again to recover the stomach. <laughs> yeah, that's how it was given with my health. The Gemütlichkeit of found over there is the, the time is not running that fast and the people are so spontaneous and so welcoming. The Gemütlichkeit is also an, an, was an inner Gemütlichkeit for me. I always feel in my culture it's very difficult to, to get into a group, to belong. And there it, they made it so easy for me to belong. After a week I was a member of the family. But this is also like if you go to the south of France, it's already really different, or the south of Italy. So this is a northern European, middle European phenomenon to me, that we are quite... And they were so open, and this really touched, touched me deeply. So this was the Gemütlichkeit which was in there. And in fact, a Gemütlichkeit would be the word I would, I would be using for what I was searching. I was searching more for how simple can life be, how pure can life be, 
and how is it to to be with a culture which okay I learned the language but still it's so far I mean I had a torch with a torch I was for sure an alien for them <laughs> so this, this, these were the moving aspects for me Yeah, do you want to visit this land another time? She was asking. Yeah, but it's a, it's a strenuous thing, you know? So I have to be like, <laughs> before I go there, because I know, Ooh, it's quite hard. You really have to work hard to get out of the place you came to, because everywhere you can fly with an international plane, you have people who are somehow used to tourists and it's very difficult was very difficult for me to get out of the of the of the capital yeah i want to go there again there is a region i want to visit it's the asmat region and i want to visit it uh, more for artistic reasons than for cultural this time or than for um, experiencing the simplicity of life. I want to visit it for, for cultural reasons because I'm very much into doing sculpture and I'm very interested in their way of thinking sculpture, feeling sculpture, doing sculpture. But before I have to solve the problem how to carry a boat on my back. Oh. <laughs> That's why I haven't gone. <laughs> yet. Yeah, Monica. Did the trip uh, change your way of thinking? Uh, I'm more hospital. So if there's anyone calling me up and saying, I'm close to your place, then I invite me. For dinner or for sleeping or whatsoever. This is something I, I'm taking from all of my journeys. And yeah. Again and again, and that's one of the reasons I'm traveling for knowing we need nothing. Nothing is important. We don't need, you know? So we need so little. And from time to time I have to, I have to experience this. Not only knowing it, there's one, one thing you can know it, but the other thing is experiencing it on your, on your body. to, to, to um, what is it, wertschätzen, uh, to appreciate, <laughs> to value, danke sehr, du bist wunderbar. Now she's really like, oh, what does she want to know, super, thank you. To value, if you turn on the, the hot water, that it simply comes out of the top. That's great. That's, 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 and to feel this miracle again, it is not enough to know it, to me, I have to go somewhere where they don't have the hot water to again be able to value that to value the, the clean water, the comfort, the security here this, I always say we are of home niveau we are suffering on a very high level if we suffer here <laughs> and to feel that again this is what I'm using using, yeah, this is what I'm using this, this is one of my major uh, points why I'm, why I'm traveling in the way I'm traveling. We are more suffering than they have. We are more suffering than, yeah, this is so crazy. We are more suffering than they are, yeah. Yeah, but that's how it is. The poorer are the happier. How paradox. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, finally we have come to the end of our program. Bearing witness to the earlier presentation, I can attest that the book is truly interesting. With it comes a CD exclusively uh, available from the author containing three original songs from the heart of Papua. So feel free to have a look with Miss Astrid and have a chat with her. But it's not over. May I remind you that the embassy would also like to use this opportunity to invite you to partake into our own presentation of the Indonesian culinary world. Dinner is served outside. Enjoy the evening, enjoy the food, 
Okay. Good team. Thank you so much for your attendance. Is it ready yet, Dina? Ah, okay. So if anyone wants to take a look, if anyone wants to have one sign or whatsoever, I'm here for you. Thank you very much.